Chapter 6 The door handle felt icy to fingers already frozen with fright, but he stood firmly grasping it, ready to turn it noiselessly when he had quite made up his mind what to do. The first expedient that suggested itself with an overpowering sweetness of relief was that of locking his door, going back to bed again, and pretending that he had heard nothing. But apart from the sheer cowardice of that, which he did not mind so much as nobody else would ever know his guilt, the thought of the burglar going off quite unmolested with his property was intolerable. Even if he could not summon up enough courage to get downstairs with his knife and a poker in his hand, he must at least give them a good fright. They had frightened him, and so he would frighten them. They should not have it all their own way, and if he decided not to attack them, or him, single-handed, he could at least thump on the floor and call out, Burglars! at the top of his voice, or shout, Charles! Henry! Thomas! as if summoning a bevy of stalwart footmen. The objection to this, of course, however, would be that Foljam or somebody else might hear him, and in this case, if he did not then go downstairs to mortal combat, the knowledge of his cowardice would be the property of others beside himself. And all the time he hesitated, they were probably filling their pockets with his dearest possessions. He tried to send out a message of love, but he was totally unable to do so. Then the little clock on his mantelpiece struck two, which was a miserable hour, sundered so far from dawn. Though he had lived through years of agony since he got out of bed, the actual passage of time, as he stood frozen to the door-handle, was but the duration of a few brief seconds, and then, making a tremendous call on his courage, he felt his way to his fireplace and picked up the poker. The tongs and shovel rattled treacherously, and he hoped that had not been heard, for the essence of his plan, though he had yet no idea what that plan was, must be silence till some awful surprise broke upon them. If only he could summon the police, he could come rushing downstairs with his poker as the professional supporters of the law gained an entrance to his house. But unfortunately the telephone was downstairs, and he could not reasonably hope to carry on a conversation with the police station without being overheard by the burglars. He opened his door with so masterly a movement that there was no sound either from the hinges nor from the handle as he turned it, and peered out. The hall below was dark, but a long pencil of light came from the drawing-room, which showed where the reckless brutes must be, and there, too, alas, was his case of treasures. Then suddenly he heard the sound of a voice speaking very low, and another voice answered it. At that Georgie's heart sank for this proved that there must be at least two burglars, and the odds against him were desperate. After that came a low, cruel laugh, the unmistakable sound of the rattle of knives and forks, and the explosive uncorking of a bottle. At this his heart sank even lower yet, for he had read that cool, habitual burglars always had supper before they got to work, and therefore he was about to deal with a gang of professionals. Also, that expensive uncorking clearly indicated champagne, and he knew that they were feasting on his best. And how wicked of them to take their unhallowed meal in his drawing-room, for there was no proper table there, and they would be making a dreadful mess over everything. A current of cool night air swept up the stairs, and Georgie saw the panel of light from the open drawing-room diminish in whiff, and presently the door shut with a soft thud, leaving him in the dark. At that... His depression seemed pressed and concentrated into a moment of fictitious courage, for he unerringly reasoned that they had left the drawing-room window open, and that perhaps in a few moments now they would have finished their meal, and with bulging pockets would step forth unchallenged into the night. Why had he never had bolts put on his shutters, like Mrs. Weston, who lived in nightly terror of burglars? But it was too late to think of that now for it was impossible to ask them to step out till he had bolts put up and then, when he was ready, begin again. He could not let them go gorged with his champagne and laden with his treasures without reprisals of some sort, and keeping his thoughts steadily away from revolvers and clubs and sandbags, walked straight downstairs, threw open the drawing-room door, and with his poker grasped in his shaking hand, cried out in a faint, thin voice, "'If you move, I shall fire!' There was a moment of dead silence, and a little dazzled with the light, he saw what faced him. At opposite ends of his Chippendale sofa sat Hermie and Ursie. 
Hermie had her mouth open and held a bun in her dirty hands. Ursy had her mouth shut and her cheeks were bulging. Between them was a ham and a loaf of bread and a pot of marmalade and a Stilton cheese. And on the floor was the bottle of champagne with two brimming bubbling teacups full of wine. The cork and the wire and the tin foil they had, with some show of decency, thrown into the fireplace. Hermie put her bun down and gave a great shout of laughter. Ursie's mouth was disgustingly full and she exploded. Then they lay back against the arms of the sofa and howled. Georgie was very much vexed. Upon my word, Hermie, he said, and then found it was not nearly a strong enough expression. And in a moment of ungovernable irritation, he said, Damn it all! Hermie showed signs of recovery first, and, as Georgie came back, after shutting the window, could find her voice, while Ursie collected small fragments of ham and bread which she had partially chewed. Lord, what a lark! she said. Georgie, it's the most ripping lark! Ursie pointed to the poker. He'll fire if we move, she cried. Or poke the fire, was it? Ask another, screamed Hermie. Oh dear, he thought we were burglars and came down with a poker, brave boy. It's positively the limit. Have a drink, Georgie. Suddenly her eyes grew round and awestruck, and pointing with her finger to Georgie's shoulder, she went off into another yell of laughter. I say, his hair, she said, and buried her face in a soft cushion. Naturally, Georgie had not put his hair in order when he came downstairs, for nobody thinks about things like that when he is going to encounter burglars single-handed, and there was his bald pate and his long tresses hanging down one side. It was most annoying, but when an irremediable annoyance has absolutely occurred, the only possible thing for a decent person to do is to take it as lightly as possible. Georgie rose gallantly to the occasion, gave a little squeal, and ran from the room. Down again presently, he called out, and had a heavy fall on the stairs as he went up to his bedroom. There he had a short argument with himself. It was possible to slam his door, go to bed, and be very polite in the morning. But that would never do. Hermie and Ursie would have a joke against him forever. It was really much better to share in the joke, identifying himself with it. So he brushed his hair in the orthodox fashion, put on a very smart dressing gown, and came tripping downstairs again. My dears, what fun, he said. Let's all have supper. But let's move into the dining room, where there's a table, and I'll get another bottle of wine and some glasses, and we'll bring Tipsy Poozy in. You naughty girls, fancy arriving at a time like this. I suppose your plan was to go very quietly to bed, and come down to breakfast in the morning and give me a fine surprise. Tell me about it now. So... Presently, Tipsy Poozy was having his marmalade, which did just as well as jam, and they were all eating slices off the ham and stuffing them into split buns. Yes, we thought we might as well do it all in one go, said Hermie. And it's a hundred and twenty miles, it was a yard. And then it'd be so late when we got here, we thought we wouldn't disturb you, especially as the drawing room window wasn't bolted. Bicycle outside, right side, said Ursie. They'll just have to be out at grass till morning. Oh, Tipsy, Tipsy Poozy Woozy, how is you? Hope he behaved like a good little tip tree that he is, Georgie. Oh, yes, we made great friends, said Georgie, sketchily. He was a wee bit upset at the station, but then he had a good tea with his uncle Georgie and played hide and seek. Rather rashly, Georgie made a face at tip tree, the sort of face which amuses children, but it didn't amuse tip tree, who made another face in which teeth played a prominent part. Fool dog, said Hermie, carelessly smacking him across the nose. Always hit him if he shows his teeth, Georgie. Pass the fizz. Well, so we got through the drawing room window, continued Ursie, and golly, we were hungry. So we foraged, and there we were. Jolly plucky of you, Georgie, to come down and beard us. Real sport, said Hermie. And how's old Folder old array? Why didn't she come down and fight us too? Georgie guessed that Hermie was making a humorous allusion to Foljam, who was the one person in Rizm whom his sisters seemed to hold in respect. Ursie had once set a booby trap for Georgie, but the mixed biscuits and Brazil nuts had descended on Foljam instead. On that occasion, Foljam, girt about in impenetrable calm, had behaved as if nothing had happened, and trod on biscuits and Brazil nuts without a smile, unaware to all appearance that there was anything whatever crunching and exploding beneath her feet. 
That had somehow quelled the two, who, as soon as she left the room again, swept up the mess and put the uninjured Brazil nuts back into the dessert dish. It would never do if Fulgham lost her prestige and was alluded to by some outrageously slangy name. If you mean Fulgham, said Georgie, icily, it was because I didn't think it worthwhile to disturb her. In spite of their ride, the indefatigable sisters were up early next morning, and the first thing Georgie saw out of his bathroom window was the pair of them practising lifting shots over the ducking pond on the green till breakfast was ready. He had given a short account of last night's adventure to Fulgham when she called him, omitting the episode about his hair, and her disapproval was strongly indicated by her silence then, and the studied contempt of her manner to the sisters when they came in to breakfast. "'Hello, Fulgham,' said Hermie. "'We had a rare lark last night.' "'So I understand, miss,' said Fulgham. "'Got in through the drawing-room window,' said Hermie, hoping to make her smile. "'Indeed, miss,' said Fulgham. "'Have you any orders for the car, sir?' "'Oh, Georgie, may we run over to the Lynx this morning?' asked Hermie. "'May Dickie Bird take us there?' She glanced at Fulgham to see whether this brilliant wit afforded her any amusement. Apparently it didn't. "'Tell Dickie to be around at half-past ten, said Georgie. "'Yes, sir.' "'Hurrah!' said Ursie. "'Come to, Fulgham, and we'll have a three-ball match.' "'No, thank you, miss,' said Fulgham, and sailed from the room, looking down her nose. "'Golly, what an iceberg!' said Hermie, when the door was quite shut. Georgie was not sorry to have the morning to himself, for he wanted to have a little quiet practice at the Mozart trio, before he went over to Lucia's at half-past eleven, the hour when she had arranged to run through it for the first time. He would also have time to do a few posturing exercises before the first yoga class, which was to take place in Lucia's smoking parlour at half-past twelve. That would make a pretty busy morning, and as for the afternoon, there would be sure to be some callers, since the arrival of his sisters had been expected, and after that he had to go to the Ambermere Arms for his visit to Olga Braceley. And what was he to do about her with regard to Lucia? Already he had been guilty of disloyalty, for Lady Ambermere had warned him of the prima donna's arrival yesterday, and he had not instantly communicated that really great piece of news to Lucia. Should he make amends, as were in his power, for that omission? Or, greatly daring, should he keep her to himself, as Mrs. Quantock so fervently wished she had done with regard to the guru? After the adventure of last night, he felt he ought to be able to look any situation in the face, but he found himself utterly unable to conceive himself manly and erect before the bird-like eyes of the Queen if she found out that Olga Braceley had been at Wisdom for the day of her garden party, and that Georgie, knowing it and having gone to see her, had not informed the court of that fact. The spirit of Bolshevism, the desire to throw off all authority and act independently, which had assailed him yesterday, returned now with redoubled force. If he had been perfectly certain that he would not be found out, there is no doubt he would have kept it from her, and yet, after all, what was the glory of going to see Olga Braceley, and perhaps even entertaining her here, if all Rism did not turn green with jealousy? Moreover, there was every chance of being found out, for Lady Ambermere would be at the garden party tomorrow, and she would be sure to wonder why Lucia had not asked Olga. Then it would come out that Lucia didn't know of that eminent presence, and Lady Ambermere would be astonished that Georgie had not told her. Thus he would be in the situation which his imagination was unable to face, although he had thrown the drawing-room door open in the middle of the night and announced that he would fire with his poker. No, he would have to tell Lucia when he went to read the Mozart trio with her for the first time, and very likely she would call on Olga Braceley herself, though nobody had asked her to, and take all the wind out of Georgie's sails. Sickening though that would be, he could not face the alternative, and he opened his copy of the Mozart trio with a sigh. Lucia did push and shove and have everything her own way. Anyhow, he would not tell her that Olga and her husband were dining at the hall tonight. He would not even tell her that her husband's name was Shuttleworth, and Lucia might make a dreadful mistake and ask Mr. and Mrs. Braceley. That would be jam for Georgie, and he could easily imagine himself saying to Lucia, My dear, 
I thought you must have known that she had married Mr. Shuttleworth and kept her maiden name. How tiresome for you. They are so touchy about that sort of thing. Georgie heard the tinkle of the treble part of the Mozart trio. Lucia always took the treble because it had more tune in it, though she pretended that she had not Georgie's fine touch, which made the bass effective, as he let himself into Shakespeare's garden a few minutes before the appointed time. Lucia must have seen him from the window, for the subdued noise of the piano ceased even before he got as far as Perdita's garden, round the sundial, and she opened the door to him. The faraway look was in her eyes, and the black undulations of hair had encroached a little on her forehead, but, after all, others besides Lucia had trouble with their hair, and Georgie only sympathised. Georgino mio, she said, it is all being so wonderful. There seems a new atmosphere about the house since my guru came, something holy and peaceful. Do you not notice it? Delicious, said Georgie, inhaling the potpourri. What is he doing now? Meditating and preparing for our class. I do hope dear Daisy will not bring in discordant elements. Oh, but that's not likely, is it? said Georgie. I thought he said she had so much light. Yes, he did. But now he's a little troubled about her, I think. She did not want him to go away from her house, and she sent over here for some silk pyjamas belonging to her husband, which she thought she had given him. But Robert didn't think so at all. The guru brought them across yesterday after he had left good thoughts for her in her house. But it was the guides who wished him to come here. They told him so, distinctly. It would have been very wrong of me not to do as they said. She gave a great sigh. Let us have an hour with Mozart, she said and repel all thought of discord. My guru says that music and flowers are good influences for those who are walkers on the way. He says that my love for both of them, which I have had all my life, will help me very much. For one moment, the mundane world obtruded itself into the calm peace. Any news in particular? she asked. I saw you drive back from the station yesterday afternoon, for I happened to be looking out of the window in a little moment of leisure. The guru says I work too hard, by the way. And your sisters were not with you. And yet there were two cabs and a quantity of luggage. Did they not come? Georgie gave a respectably accurate account of all that had happened, omitting the fact of his terror when he first awoke, for that was not really a happening, and it had no effect on his subsequent proceedings. He also omitted the adventure about his hair, for that was quite extraneous, and said what fun they had all had over their supper at half-past two this morning. I think you were marvellously brave, Georgie, said she, and most good-natured. You must have been sending out love, and so were full of it yourself, and that cast out fear. She spread the music open. Anything else? she asked. Georgie took his seat and put his rings on the candle bracket. Oh, yes, he said. Olga Bracely, the prima donna, you know, and her husband are arriving at the Ambermere Arms this afternoon for a couple of days. The old fire kindled. No, exclaimed Lucia. Then they'll be here for my party tomorrow. Fancy if she would come and sing for us. I shall certainly leave cards today and write later in the evening asking her. I have been asked to go and see her, said Georgie, not proudly. The music rest fell down with a loud slap, but Lucia paid no attention. Let us go together then, she said. Who asked you to call on her? Lady Ambermere, said he. When she was in here yesterday, she never mentioned it to me. But she would certainly think it very odd of me not to call on friends of hers and be polite to them. What time shall we go? Georgie made up his mind that wild horses should not drag from him the fact that Olga's husband's name was Shuttleworth, for here was Lucia grabbing at his discovery, just as she had grabbed at Daisy's discovery, who was now her guru. She would call him Mr. Bracely then. Somewhere about six, do you think? said he, inwardly raging. He looked up and distinctly saw that sharp, foxy expression cross Lucia's face, which, from long knowledge of her, he knew to betoken that she had thought of some new plan. But she did not choose to reveal it and re-erected the music rest. That will do beautifully, she said. And now for our heavenly Mozart. You must be patient with me, Georgie, for you know how badly I read. Caro! How difficult it looks! I am frightened! Lucia never saw such a dreadful thing to read! And it had been those very bars which Georgie had heard through the open window just now. 
Georgie's is more dreadful, he said, remembering the double shock that came in the second bar. Georgie frightened too at reading it. Ooh, and he gave a little scream. Cattivo Mozart to write anything so dreadful diffy. It was quite clear at the class this morning that though the pupils were quite interested in the abstract messages of love which they were to shoot out in all directions and in the atmosphere of peace with which they were to surround themselves, the branch of the subject which thrilled them to the marrow was the breathing exercises and contortions which, if persevered in, would give them youth and activity, thoughtless digestions and indefatigable energy. They all sat on the floor and stopped up alternate nostrils and held their breath till Mrs. Quantock got purple in the face and Georgie and Lucia red and expelled their breath again with sudden puffs that set the rushes on the floor quivering or with long, quiet exhalations. Then there were certain postures to be learned, in one of which, entailing the bending of the body backwards, two of Georgie's trouser buttons came off with a sharp snap and he felt the corresponding number of his braces, thus violently released, spring up to his shoulder. Various other embarrassing noises issued from Lucia and Daisy that sounded like the bursting of strings and tapes, but everybody pretended to hear nothing at all or covered up the report of those explosions with coughings and clearings of the throat. But apart from these discordances, Everything was fairly harmonious, indeed. So far from Daisy introducing discords, she wore a fixed smile, which it would have been purely cynical to call superior, when Lucia asked some amazingly simple question with regard to Om. She sighed, too, at intervals, but these sighs were expressive of nothing but patience and resignation till Lucia's ignorance of the most elementary doctrines was enlightened, and though she rather pointedly looked in any direction but hers, and appeared completely unaware of her presence, she had not, after all, come here to look at Lucia, but to listen to her own, whatever Lucia might say, guru. At the end, Lucia, with her faraway look, emerged, you might say, in a dazed condition from hearing about the fastness of Tibet, where the guru had been in commune with the guides, whose wisdom he interpreted to them. I feel such a difference already, she said dreamily. I feel as if I could never be hasty or worried any more at all. Don't you experience that, dear Daisy? Yes, dear, said she. I went through all that at my first lesson, didn't I, Guru, dear? I felt it too, said Georgie, unwilling not to share in these benefits and surreptitiously tightening his trouser snap to compensate for the loss of buttons. And am I to do that swaying exercise before every meal? Yes, Georgie, said Lucia, saving her guru from the trouble of answering. Five times to the right, and five times to the left, and then five times backwards and forwards. I felt so young and light just now when we did it. I thought I was rising into the air. Didn't you, Daisy? Daisy smiled kindly. No, dear, that is levitation, she said, and comes a very long way on. She turned briskly towards her guru. Will you tell them about the time when you levitated at Paddington Station, she said, or will you keep that for when Mrs. Lucas gets further on? You must be patient, dear Lucia. We all have to go through the early stages before we get to that. Mrs. Quantock spoke as if she was in the habit of levitating herself, and it was but reasonable, in spite of the love that was swirling about them all, that Lucia should protest against such an attitude. Humility, after all, was the first essential to progress on the way. Yes, dear, she said. We will tread these early stages together and encourage each other. Georgie went home, feeling also unusually light and hungry, for he had paid special attention to the exercise that enabled him to have his liver and digestive organs in complete control, but that did not prevent him from devoting his mind to arriving at that which had made Lucia look so sharp and foxy during their conversation about Olga Bracely. He felt sure that she was meaning to steal a march on him, and she was planning to draw first blood with the prima donna, and, as likely as not, claim her for her own, with the same odious greed as she was already exhibiting with regard to the guru. All these years, Georgie had been her faithful servant and coadjutor. Now, for the first time, the spirit of independence had begun to seethe within him. The scales were falling from his eyes, and just as he turned into shelter of his mulberry tree, he put on his spectacles to see how Rizm was getting on without him to assist at the morning parliament. 
His absence and Mrs Quantock's would be sure to evoke comment, and since the yoga classes were always to take place at half-past twelve, the fact that they would never be there would soon rise to the level of a first-class mystery. It would, of course, begin to leak out that they and Lucia were having a course of Eastern philosophy that made its pupils young and light and energetic, and there was a sensation. Like all great discoveries, the solution of Lucia's foxy look broke on him with the suddenness of a lightning flash, and since it had been settled that she should call for him at six, he stationed himself in the window of his bath room, which commanded a perfect view of the village green and the entrance to the Ambermere Arms, at five. He had brought up with him a pair of opera glasses, with the intention of taking them to bits, so he had informed Foljam, and washing their lenses. But he did not at once proceed about this, merely holding them ready to hand for use. Hermie and Ursi had gone back to their golf again after lunch, and so callers would be told that they were all out. Thus he could wash the lenses, when he chose to do so, uninterrupted. The minutes passed on pleasantly enough, for there was plenty going on. The two Miss Antrobuses frisked about the green, jumping over the stocks in their playful way, and running round the duck pond, in the eternal hope of attracting Colonel Boucher's attention to their pretty nimble movements. For many years past, they had tried to gain Georgie's serious attention, without any result, and lately they had turned to Colonel Boucher. There was Mrs. Antrobus there, too, with her ham-like face and her ear-trumpet, and Mrs. Weston was being pushed round and round the asphalt path below the elms in her bath chair. She hated going slow, and her gardener and his boy took turns with her during her hour's carriage exercise and propelled her, amid streams of perspiration, at a steady four miles an hour. As she passed Mrs. Antrobus, she shouted something at her, and Mrs. Antrobus returned her reply when next she came round. Suddenly all these interesting objects vanished completely from Georgie's ken, for his dark suspicions were confirmed, and there was Lucia in her high tom hat and her high tom gown, making her gracious way across the green. She had distinctly been wearing one of the scrub this morning at the class, so she must have changed after lunch, which was an unheard of thing to do for a mere stroll on the green. Georgie knew well that this was no mere stroll, she was on her way to pay a call of the most formal and magnificent kind. She did not deviate a hair breath from her straight course to the door of the arms. She just waggled her hand to Mrs. Antrobus, blew a kiss to her sprightly daughters, made a graceful bow to Colonel Boucher, who stood up and took his hat off, and went on with the inexorability of the March of Destiny, or of fate knocking at the door in the immortal Fifth Symphony. And in her hand she carried a note. Through his glasses Georgie could see it plainly, and it was not a little folded-up sheet, such as she commonly used, but a square, thick envelope. She disappeared in the arms, and Georgie began thinking feverishly. A great deal depended on how long she stopped there. A few little happenings beguiled the period of waiting. Mrs. Weston desisted from her wild career, and came to anchor on the path just opposite the door to the arms, while the gardener's boy sank exhausted onto the grass. It was quite easy to guess that she proposed to have a chat with Lucia when she came out. Similarly, the Miss Antrobuses, who had paid no attention to her at all before, ceased from their pretty gambolings and ran up to talk to her, so they wanted a word too. Colonel Boucher, a little less obviously, began throwing sticks into the ducking pond for his bulldog, for Lucia would be obliged to pass the ducking pond, and Mrs. Antrobus examined the stocks very carefully, as if she had never seen them before. And then, before a couple of minutes had elapsed, Lucia came out. She had no longer the note in her hand, and Georgie began taking his opera glasses to bits in order to wash the lenses. For the present they had served their purpose. She has left a note on Olga Bracely, said Georgie quite aloud, so powerful was the current of his thoughts. Then, as a corollary, came the further proposition which might be considered as proved. But she had not seen her. The justice of this conclusion was soon proved, for Lucia had hardly disengaged herself from the group of her subjects and traversed the green on her way back to her house when a motor passed Georgie's bathroom window, closely followed by a second. Both drew up at the entrance to the Ambermere Arms. 
With the speed of a practised optician, Georgie put his opera glass together again, and after looking through the wrong end of it in his agitation, was in time to see a man get out of the second car and hold the carriage door open for the occupants of the first. A lady got out first, tall and slight in figure, who stood there unwinding her motor veil. Then she turned round again, and with a thump of his heart that surprised Georgie with its violence, he beheld the well-remembered features of his Brunhilde. Swiftly he passed into his bedroom next door, and arrayed himself in his summer high tums, a fresh, almost pearly suit of white duck, a mauve tie with an amethyst pin in it, socks tightly braced up, of precisely the same colour as the tie, so that an imaginative beholder might have conjectured that on this warm day the end of his tie had melted and run down his legs, buckskin shoes with tall slim heels, and a straw hat completed this pretty high tum. He had meant to wear it for the first time at Lucia's party tomorrow, but now, after her meanness, she deserved to be punished. All Rizm should see it before she did. The group round Mrs. Weston's chair was still engaged in conversation when Georgie came up, and he casually let slip what a bore it was to pay calls on such a lovely day, but he had promised to visit Miss Olga Bracely, who had just arrived. So there was another nasty one for Lucia, since now all Rizm would know of her actual arrival before Lucia did. "'And who is to draw there?' asked Mrs. Antrobus, presenting her trumpet to him in the manner in which an elephant presents its trunk to receive a bun. "'Who was that with her?' "'Oh, her husband, Mr. Shuttleworth,' said Georgie. "'They've just been married and are on their honeymoon.' And if that was not another staggerer for Lucia, it is diffy, as Georgie would say, to know what a staggerer is. For Lucia would be the last of all to know that this was not Mr. Bracely. And will they be at Mrs. Lucas' party tomorrow? asked Mrs. Weston. Oh, does she know them? asked Georgie. Ho, ho, by Jove, began Colonel Badger. Very handsome woman, envy of my boy. Pity it's their honeymoon, ha! Huh? Mrs. Antrobus's trumpet was turned in his direction at this moment, and she heard these daring remarks. Naughty, she said, and Georgie, the envied, passed in into the inn. He sent in his card, on which he had thought it prudent to write, from Lady Ambermere, and was presently led through into the garden behind the building. There she was, tall and lovely and welcoming, and held out a most cordial hand. How kind of you to come and see us, she said. Georgie, this is Mr. Pilson, my husband. How do you do, Mr. Shuttleworth? said Georgie, to show he knew, though his own Christian name had given him quite a start. For the moment he had almost thought she was speaking to him. And so Lady Ambermere asked you to come and see us, Olga went on. I think that was much kinder of her than to ask us to dinner. I hate going out to dinner in the country almost as much as I hate not going out to dinner in town. Besides, with that great hook nose of hers, I'm always afraid that in an absent moment I might scratch her on the head and say, Pretty Polly. Is she a great friend of yours, Mr. Pilson? I hope so, because everyone likes his best friends being laughed at. Up till that moment, Georgie was prepared to indicate that Lady Ambermere was the hand and he the glove. But evidently that would not impress Olga in the least. He laughed in a most irreverent manner instead. Don't let us go, she went on. Georgie, can't you send a telegram saying that we have just discovered a subsequent engagement and then we'll ask Mr. Pilson to show us around this utterly adorable place and dine with us afterwards. That would be so much nicer. Fancy living here. Oh, and do tell me something, Mr. Pilson. I found a note when I arrived half an hour ago from Mrs. Lucas asking me and Mr. Shuttleworth to go to a garden party tomorrow. She said she didn't even hope that I should remember her, but would we come? Who is she? Really, I don't think she can remember me very well if she thinks I am Mrs. Bracely. Georgie says I must have been married before, and that I have caused him to commit bigamy. That's pleasant conversation for a honeymoon, isn't it? Who is she? Oh, she's quite an old friend of mine, said Georgie, though I never knew she'd met you before. I'm devoted to her. Extremely proper. But now tell me this, and look straight in my face, so that I shall know if you are speaking the truth. Should I enjoy myself more wandering about this heavenly place than at her garden party? 
Georgie felt that poor Lucia was really punished enough by this time. You will give her a great deal of pleasure if you go, he began. Ah, oh, that's not fair. It is hitting below the belt to appeal to unselfish motives. I've come here simply to enjoy myself. Go on, eyes front. The candour and friendliness of that beautiful face gave Georgie an impulse of courage. Besides, though no doubt in fun, she had already suggested that it would be much nicer to wander about with him and dine together than spend the evening among the splendours of the hall. I got a suggestion, he said. Will you come and lunch with me first, and we'll stroll about, and then we can go to the garden party, and if you don't like it, I'll take you away again. Done, she said. Now don't you try to get out of it, because my husband is a witness. Georgie, give me a cigarette. In a moment, Rizm Georgie had his cigarette case open. Do take one of mine, he said. I'm Georgie too. You don't say so. Let's send it to the physical research, or whoever those people are who collect coincidences and say it spooks. And a match, please, one of you Georgies. Oh, how I should like never to see the inside of an opera house again. Why mayn't I grow on the walls of a garden like this? Or better still, why shouldn't I have a house and garden of my own here, and sing on the village green and ask for halfpennies? Tell me what happens here. I've always lived in town since the time a hook-nosed Hebrew, rather like Lady Ambermere, took me out of the gutter. My dear, said Mr. Shuttleworth, well, I'd have an orphan school at Brixton, and I would much prefer the gutter. That's all about my early life just now, because I am keeping it for my memoirs, which I shall write when my voice becomes a little more like a steam whistle. But don't tell Lady Ambermere, for she would have a fit. But say you happen to know that I belong to the Surrey Braceleys. So I do. Brixton is on the Surrey side. Oh, my dear, look at the sun. It's behaving like the best sort of Claude. Hyla Sona. I heard you do that last May, said Georgie. Then you heard a most second-rate performance, said she. But really, being unlaced by that thing, that great fat profligate beery Prussian, was almost too much for me, and the duet. But it was very polite of you to come, and I will do better next time. Siegfried, Brunhilde, Siegfried, meow, meow. Bring on the next lot of cats. Darling Georgie, wasn't it awful? And you had proposed to me only the day before. I was absolutely enchanted, said Rizm Georgie. Yes, but then you didn't have that thing breathing beer into your innocent face. Georgie rose. The first call on a stranger in Rizm was never supposed to last more than half an hour, however much you were enjoying it, and never less, however bored you might be, and he felt sure he had already exceeded this. I must be off, he said. Too delightful to think that you and Mr. Shuttleworth will come to lunch with me tomorrow. Half past one, shall we say? Excellent. But where do you live? Just across the green. Shall I call for you? He asked. Certainly not. Why should you have that bother? She said. Ah, let me come with you to the inn door, and perhaps you will show me from there. She passed through the hall with him, and they stood together in the sight of all Rizm, which was strolling about the green at this, as at most other hours. Instantly, all faces turned round in their direction, like so many sunflowers following the sun, while Georgie pointed out his particular mulberry tree. When everybody had had a good look, he raised his hat. A domani, then, she said, so many thanks. And quite distinctly, she kissed her hand to him as he turned away. So she talks Italian, too, thought Georgie, as he dropped little crumbs of information to his friends on his way to his house. Domani, that means tomorrow. Oh yes, she was meaning lunch. It is hardly necessary to add that on the table in his hall there was one of Lucia's commoner kinds of note, merely a half-sheet folded together in her own manner. Georgie felt that it was scarcely more necessary to read it, for he felt quite sure that it contained some excuse for not coming to his house at six in order to call on Mr. and Mrs. Braceley. But he gave a glance at it before he rolled it up in a ball for Tipsy Toosie to play with, and found its contents to be precisely what he expected, the excuse being that she had not done her practising. But the postscript was interesting, for it told him that she had asked Foljam to give her his copy of Siegfried. Georgie strolled down past the hearst before dinner. Mozart was silent now, but there came out of the open windows the most amazing hash of sound, 
which he could just recognise as being the piano arrangement of the duet between Brunhilde and Siegfried at the end. He would have been dull indeed if he had not instantly guessed what that signified.